Hello. Hey. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, my talk is kind of provocatively called quitting PIP. Obviously, we don't quit PIP. We still use PIP to manage external dependencies. But uh, we found submodules to be a very good way to manage internal dependencies. So I work for a company that's called Mediair. We uh, have one product that's called MD Brain. And we basically take MRI images and uh, use computer vision to extract some features from that and generate reports that help doctors make better diagnoses. And our software is basically a very common setup, I believe. It's a microservice architecture of different backend components, all written in Python. And so we have lots of different repositories um, that make up our entire application. Um, <clears throat> How we started with that was just a handful of components, and those would just pull in some random uh, external dependencies, so maybe some NumPy and uh, matplotlib to generate some nice plots. And we're all pulling these just from the regular Python package index. And over time, our application grew, so we added more components. And then it started to make sense to extract some of the common functionality into a library. Um, but now we have to deal with how do we distribute this library within our organization. And I just want to take a quick detour to the Zen of Python. Uh, it's this beautiful poem that is included in the Python interpreter. So if you run import this, you get a lot of philosophical truth about language design, I guess. And uh, my kind of little rant here is that number 13 does not really hold up for package management in Python. There should be one and preferably only one obvious way to do it. And that's just not true for package management in Python. Uh, we have not only one official package manager, but a bunch of other third-party alternatives. And pip also used to be easy installed. It's uh, kind of a mess there. And we also have a different package formats that you can use with pip. Uh, you can point it to a local source directory just on your hard disk and install from there. You can build a wheel or an egg, which both kind of are pro uh, projects to incorporate binary extensions in Python. Uh, you can point it to a Git URL uh, and check out a specific branch or hash of a commit ID. Um, and you can also point it to a URL containing a zip. So there's lots of different options on how to distribute your packages, even via pip only. And also, then you need to do some sort of environment separation because you don't want to install all your uh, packages in the global namespace. So there's venf, which is included in the standard library, but pipenv and uh, virtualenv are also kind of recommended by the packaging authority. Conda also does its own thing. There's lots of different options. Um, teaser here, we do not use any kind of uh, environment separation because we use Docker, so no virtual environments for us. I'm just going to say that, so you can keep that in mind. This is a very opinionated talk, obviously, and I just want to tell you what works for us, so maybe you can draw some inspiration from that. Um, yeah, so in the end, what did we do? We thought, OK, the easiest thing probably is to just uh, put that on GitHub. It's mostly some glue code, database interactions, work queue management. That's not necessarily anything secretive. So we just put it on GitHub. and. Um, pointed our requirements.txt file to the git URL and the hash or the tag of the version that we want to use. That worked perfectly. Uh, you can just push new changes, tag them, and then update your version tag in the requirements file, and you're good to go. And um, yeah, then we continued adding more and more components and more and more machine learning components. So a lot of stuff that actually contains delicate business logic that we maybe don't really want to share publicly on GitHub. Obviously, we could also turn the GitHub repository private, but then we would have to deal with all kinds of authentication. And yeah, it was just not really cutting it. So in the end, we thought, OK, we're just going to stick with what we know. Uh, the Python package index works really well for distributing our packages. Pip manages the dependencies very well. So we started hosting our own uh, private uh, package index, basically. You, you can just run your own PyPy server, and we build our wheels for our packages of the common libraries, put them there, and just put the name in the requirements file. That was fine for a while, but over the course of uh, a couple of months, years, we just discovered a bunch of problems with this approach. And the first thing is, as I mentioned uh, just now, is iter uh, authentication. You obviously also have that with your private PyPy instance. Uh, if you run something like that, you don't really want to have it 
publicly available on the internet. That would kind of defeat the purpose of having it private in the first place. Uh, so you have to hide it behind some sort of VPN, and then you need to put the credentials on all the machines that you want to build your Docker images or your, your packages with. And you also need to put some sort of uh, way into the CI to authenticate against the VPN and access that server. Um, but our main thing was uh, fast iteration. So usually it would go like this. We have a feature that we want to implement in one of our components or multiple thereof. And uh, we also need to make some changes in our common library. And then we would take the library, make some work in progress version, build a wheel, push that to our PyPy server, pull it on the other side, only to find out you made some sort of stupid typo and you have to do it all over again. And you just bloat your PyPy with lots of work in progress uh, versions of your packages. And then you need to go back and delete those afterwards. It's just, it's a pain. Um, obviously, you could also change your workflow just for making those changes to point to the local directory. But then it doesn't build on CI. You cannot change the work in progress. Uh, you cannot share the work in progress changes with your colleagues. So, that was just not really working for our fast iteration internally. Um, the package index is a really great tool to archive versions of your library and serve those for a long time, but not so much if you want to iterate quickly during development. And also, it's a single point of failure, which is not nice if our server dies. Nobody can work. Nobody can pull packages. Um, and we're all blocked. We kind of only want to write software. We don't want to host infrastructure um, and take care of it. Version compatibility is also another issue. If you want to upgrade your Python version, oftentimes you have to rebuild old packages, especially if you have various um, components that still depend on older versions. You have to rebuild all of those. And if you forgot to rebuild one version and want to go back in your history at some point, then you have to rebuild. It's, it's a whole mess. And um, also, it's a security issue. Believe it or not, there, there has been actual hacks of big companies like PayPal and Microsoft where people took internal package names, which they figured out through some sort of, um, I guess, people didn't watch out, leave, left the internal names in the requirements files of some open source packages or something. And then people were creating malicious packages and uploaded them. If they have a newer version than your internal one, Pip is just going to silently pull that from the public PyPy instead of the private one, and then executes whatever is in there in your info file. So, there is ways to go about that. You, you can change the default settings for pip to ignore other sources and stuff like that, but it's a whole setup, and it's just something we didn't want to deal with anymore. So uh, now to the title of the talk, we use git submodules for that. Um, what are git submodules? I have the conception that a lot of people are kind of afraid of it um, or didn't really look into it, so I really like them. They're, once you understand how they work, they're pretty simple and an elegant way of solving all these kind of issues. And basically, a Git submodule is uh, a Git inside of your Git. Um, and the important thing to remember here is that it's, it's basically a black box. You have a Git within a Git, and the outer layer of the, the, the outer Git does not see anything about the inner Git source tree apart from the commit hash of the hat that the inner Git is pointing to. So you can have them completely separate but you can track changes in your child repository in the outer layer. Um, I'm just going to do a little bit of a quick uh, intro to submodules in some sort of demo fashion um, to get you up to speed on that. So if you want to use submodules in Git, it's kind of like an extension. You have to enable it. So you run a Git submodule in it, and that's going to turn your repository into a submodule repository. And then you can add submodules using git submodule add, and then I put a local path here, dot dot library, dot dot slash library, that's one layer up. Um, but you can point to an SSH or an HTTP URL, wherever your repository lives. And then the second parameter is the name of the directory that you want to put your submodule into there. I chose to use a different name here just to make it more clear to you which one is the submodule and which one is the origin of the submodule. Um, yeah, and if you look at git status now, you can see that git. Uh, created two files for us. First, library sub is the directory that we actually wanted. That's where all our submodule code is included. And then it also created a .git modules file. And uh, the beauty of Git is it's, it's in a very true Unix fashion. It's all plain text files. You can very easily inspect what's going on inside of Git. So I just look into that file. And um, as you can see, it's just a little bit of an entry where it says, OK, I have a submodule called library, and it's located in this path. And uh, the URL, where the origin URL is also given here. Um, 
And now let's look uh, into the submodule here. Um, if we make some changes um, and check out the status, uh, we can basically see, okay, we have a changed file. But if we go to our parent project and look at it, it just tells us, okay, our submodule has modified content. And that's what I meant. It doesn't look inside. It doesn't tell us, oh, there's a new file called change.txt in our submodule. It just sees that there has been some changes. And um, if we now commit these changes within the submodule um, and check the status in the outer layer, it tells us, okay, new commits have happened. Um, so that's all we see in the outer layer. Um, <clears throat> and uh, now I can commit these changes in the outer layer so that the outer git knows, okay, I want to point my submodule to this commit now instead of another one. So in the outer layer, you can control which version of your, or which reference, say a tag or a branch or um, any other kind of reference that is valid in Git, which one of these should my submodule be pointing at? So I can control the state of my submodules in the outer layer. And the inner layer doesn't know anything about that. So um, if I look here in my outer layer, like uh, the demo slash library directory, that's where the origin was of our submodule. And the origin was not touched at all. So I created the file in the submodule, and all the changes are local to that directory. The origin does not know anything about that. Um, so I can create branches in my submodule, and the outer layer is not going to see those until I push them. Um, if I add changes to my um, branch and then push these, then I can see that my origin of my submodule actually received that branch, and I could check that out. So you can basically work on your libraries within the projects that you're making the changes in, that you need the changes in the library for, and then push these to your origin of your library and basically work from wherever you need on your libraries. Um, and in the outer layer, uh, oops, sorry. In the outer layer, we can not see any of the inner branches. It's completely separate. So if I look at the outer demo project directory, it just has one branch. It doesn't know anything about the branching structure within our submodule. It's completely separate. And the way we use this to manage our uh, library and dependencies internally is we have a very common uh, project structure. I mean, it's, not, it's more of a convention, but I think everybody pretty much does it like that. You have your project, uh, the, the Git repository, and then there's some auxiliary files, your readme, Docker files, Docker ignore, whatever build scripts you need. And uh, then you have another layer inside of it that is named the same as the outer layer, and that's where your actual a uh, package directory is at, so a package directory in Python is everything that has a dunder init.py file in there, and that makes it a package. So there's one layer of nesting here. In the Git repository, there's another, repo uh, another directory that is our project directory, and our libraries look exactly the same. Um, and now there's uh, two ways you could go, uh, go about this, where to add the library to the project. Um, the first would just be to basically just uh, Install it in there, add the submodule um, to the top level, and then you have the problem of how do I tell my Python um, name resolution where to find my package. Um, so in this case, you would have to add the inner layer of your library submodule to the Python path because um, it's nested one layer deep because of the way we structure our project directories, and the Python interpreter is not going to find it. It's going to look into the library folder, not find a dunder init file, and disregard it as a package. So it can't find our uh, actual package directory if you don't modify our Python path. But messing with the environment, changing the path, that can lead to all kinds of different problems, especially if you work with um, other projects like OpenVINO, there was a talk earlier here that also requires you to change uh, your path setup and everything. Um, obviously, you could solve this within a virtual environment, but as I said, we're not really using those. We're using Docker. Um, so what we ended up with is basically creating a, a wrapper so we don't clone into the exact name of the library. We clone into a prefix version. We use underscore. You could use a dot, whatever you want. And then we create a Zimlink um, from the inner package directory into the outer layer. So now our library lives in the same directory as our project, um, 
Python package, and our um, Python is just going to pick up the library as is would be a first-class citizen with our uh, other project directory. And the beauty of that is that we can create the symlink and we commit the symlink to Git, and everybody that pulls the directory, uh, the repository is just going to have everything ready. You don't need to mess with the path or anything else. All your dependencies are there in your first clone. Um, well, technically, you have to uh, initialize and update your submodules, but that's that's one more step. Um, so the benefits of this is that you can point submodules uh, to branches. So whenever I work on a feature in my project, uh, we usually have a branch with a ticket name as the branch name. And then I can just say, OK, I have these different um, dependencies, and they point to stable tags. But the one that I need to change, I just create a work in progress branch here, and they share the same name. So it's very obvious which changes go together. And um, I can just work within my directory. I don't have to go back and forth between my library and my project. It's all contained in there. Um, and what I think is really nice is you can have the same library in multiple states on disk at the same time. Um, imagine you're working on a feature, and the tests are taking a long time to run, and you just want to do something in between, and you work on another problem, but you have to make incompatible changes in the same library at the same time. I mean, it's a bit of a corner case, but it happened to me. And with this, you, can, you don't have to go back and like check out the branch, stash your changes, check out the other branch, go back and forth. That's just going to create problems, human error. Um, with this, you can have all of your tickets completely separate, at least within one uh, across projects, and uh, check out multiple states at the same time. And uh, yeah, as I talked about it before, um, if you just add the symlink, you get uh, IDE support, full um, syntax highlighting and uh, IntelliSense. Yeah, the visual debugger works. You can just start, jump into all of your code. It's very convenient, and there's no setup required. Um, obviously, it also has some disadvantages, for sure. Um, first thing is external dependency resolution. <clears throat> if your libraries have some external dependencies, and they come with their own requirements file, usually, if you install them via pip, pip is going to figure out from all the dependencies in the graph which one of the compatible versions you could install. But if you don't install your libraries, but embed them in the source code, you don't get the re dependency resolution of pip. So what you would end up have to do is take all your requirements files and concatenate those. But because of the way pip works, the, the order of things that you specify matters. So in the end, it can be kind of hard to figure out which versions of external dependencies you ended up installing. Um, because pip, for example, is not going to install a newer version if it's already installed, if you don't pass upgrade or ignore installed. So yeah, that can be a bit messy. Um, duplication, obviously, is an issue. I mean, you keep a lot of copies of the same library on your disk for every project. So if your libraries are big, disk space might be an issue here. Um, also, compile time, if you have native extensions and you need to build these every time you update the uh, dependency uh, and you have multiple ones. You, you don't get the caching, um, so you have to rebuild all your extensions all the time. And also, in your Docker, you have to clone all these directories. And um, yeah, that just can take more time. Um, also, in the workflow, there is a bit of a learning curve. You just have to kind of get the grips of Git submodules. And um, yeah, you just have to learn how that works. And sometimes they can behave in a bit of a weird way. So there is a learning curve there. And also, you always have to call Git a submodule update whenever you switch branches. If you forget to do that, your submodule is not going to change its state to the one that you want in your new branch. So you just have to keep that in mind to not make errors. Um, and yeah, you don't. You, you have to really watch out to not commit some uh, untagged state in in your your final version. Um, but we can use some automations to ease the pain of all these different points. So to prevent untagged submodules on your CI. We just have a little script um, that checks all the heads of all the submodules and whether there is a tag for it. And if there is not, um, it's just going to fail the pipeline. So here we can see, oh, we have a tag that is not semantic versioning. You can see there is, has been some work in progress changes. Somebody committed that. And our CI is just not going to let us merge that until we point it to a tagged stable version. Um, the GitLab UI. Uh, is, is kind of not so easy to deal with because they only show you the short hashes of the projects, uh, of the submodules, and that doesn't really get us anywhere. So we wrote a little bit of a browser extension. It's 50 lines of code. Uh, really not a big deal. 
Oops, I'm sorry. Um, and now you can see just the uh, version tags. So that, that's very convenient because in the old, old way, we could just look at the requirements file and see which of the, depend, which of the versions we actually depend on right now. But with a submodule approach, you would have to go into each and every one and do git describe. So uh, this solves that problem for us. And this is not necessarily specific to this approach to dependency uh, management, but uh, we also have a script that automatically checks that all the dependencies are at the latest version, kind of like dependabot or all kinds of other uh, bots that exist like that, so that you just have to make a tailored version for the submodule approach. And all these uh, code examples, I'm going to give you the link to our GitHub repository later on. Um, it's very specific to our pipeline, obviously, but maybe you can draw some inspiration from that for your own setup. Um, uh, yeah, we, we also have a bot that will, I'm sorry, um, will automatically create pull requests to update. Um, as I said, that's a very common use case. Type checking is another issue, because if you put all your uh, code in the same directory, the type checker is not going to know which one is your actual project and which one is the dependency. So maybe if there's some type errors there that you want to ignore. Uh, the way it works in MyPy is just you have to ignore all errors and then exclude your personal directory. Um, that's another little tidbit. So in the end, just to summarize this, we started out with just putting stuff publicly on GitHub and then uh, used our private PyPy server and then looked at a lot of different options. And in the end, uh, we ended up with using Git submodules for, for the internal dependency uh, management, and we created some automations uh, to make our lives easier here. Uh, and that's really good for fast iteration of internal dependencies where you don't want to rebuild packages all the time. Uh, it's a very simple setup. You don't have to mess with uh, the virtual environments or the path or everything. And you clone it, you have all your dependencies ready, and you can just jump in there. And it's very decoupled across projects, so you can work on different things at the same time. Um, just as a little bit of an outlook, there's other options that you could look at to manage this kind of problem. If you have a mono repo and you just keep everything in one big source tree, you obviously don't have the problem of managing these. Uh, big companies like Google do that. They even created their own source control because their source was so big that it didn't fit into any existing one. Um, didn't really work out for us, but that's something that you might want to look into. The previous talk actually also talked about things to make your life easier in that kind of situation. Uh, and talking about Git extensions, there's not only Git submodule, but there's also Git subtree. And uh, I think that's even a lesser known feature. I just told you a lot about how the submodule is very, it's a black box for the outer layer. And with Git subtree, it's basically not a black box. You see, the outer Git sees all uh, the code that is in the inner Git, but you can extract kind of that subdirectory as its own Git repository. So I think that can also work really well with monorepos. Maybe that's not something that you want to check out. And there's also Git work tree. And I haven't really looked into that myself either, but it's, it's apparently a way where you can check out multiple branches at the same time on disk. I'm not sure how that works entirely, but if, if that's something you want to have, maybe look into that. Uh, yeah, if you want to reach out to me, just chat me up at the conference. I'm happy to talk about our experiences here. And you can find my GitHub. And also, there's a, I'm, I'm going to try to make a text version of this talk if you want to read that up later. Um, but also, if you're interested in working with machine learning and uh, neuro images and help doctors uh, make better diagnoses, maybe take a look at our company and what we're doing. We're also looking for new talent, so um, be, we're happy to take your applications. And yeah, there's a lot of code examples and stuff uh, on our GitHub repository of the company. So check that out if you're interested in trying that out for your company or setup. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Yes, um, thank you, Philip, for this great talk. Um, let's get started with the Q&A. Uh, please submit all your questions via Slido. We already got quite a few. So first off is, how did you create slash display those very nice terminal demos? <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> in Keynote, there's a, a, a transition effect called typewriter or something, and it just types whatever you do. It's a bit messy because you want the prompt to appear immediately. So it was just a lot of nitty gritty grinding work of putting, OK, this should appear, this should be typed, this should appear. I just animated it by hand, to be honest. <laughs> OK. Uh, then have you considered monorepos and build tools like Bazel? If so, what, what were the main reasons not to do it? 
Uh, we looked at the monorepo and we had a long discussion about if we want to do monorepo or continue with this multi-repo thing. Um, for us, the main problem is if we end up not liking it, it's kind of hard to go back and disentangle all the mixed up history. And um, yeah, we just didn't want to take the risk at this point. We've, we found our solution is good enough for now and maybe we can change to uh, a monorepo later, but going the other direction is kind of hard. So we were just cautious about that. Yeah. Uh, all right, then uh, why not use pip install minus e instead of symlinking, like a editable install? Yeah, but um, if you do the editable install, um, that's just one more step you have to perform. And especially with the way we set up our Docker containers and we, we just copy the inner repository and it just makes the local environment and the Docker environment more consistent for us. But it's a very good option if you, if you don't target Docker, I would say. Okay, then why not pip plus git? The authentication issue for the private libs also occurs when using git submodules, doesn't it? Uh, not necessarily because on GitLab you can use, uh, I, I don't know about GitHub, but on GitLab you can use uh, <coughs> relative URLs also for um, Git submodules and we have our organization and then different groups and you just do dot dot slash library and it's just going to pull from there so you don't need to authenticate uh, against GitHub again if you're, or GitLab if you're already on GitLab in the CI. So um, that's not an authentication issue. Okay, then another one. How well does this work with CI pipelines? Uh, yeah, we, we use a lot of CI pipelines and it works really well because you don't have to go to your private pipe, uh, Python server or whatever. Uh, GitLab is smart enough to do all the clones automatically and the checkouts, so it just works, works mm -hmm. very well. Okay, this one probably is already answered. It's about submodules and why.mono. Then, uh, why not build and upload package to a local repository as part of a CI pipeline? For example, GitLab offers private package registry. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's kind of similar to using our private uh, PyPy instance. Um, yeah, our problem was mainly the, the iteration aspect of it. If I do my changes locally and I want to work on that, um, I just don't want to build packages all the time. The CI obviously can do that later on, but just during development, that can be kind of painful. Um, Okay, and then how do you solve third-party version conflicts? Um, I'm not entirely sure how to interpret the question, but I think that the version conflicts, uh, that's, that's basically what I was talking about with the dependency confusion attack. That's, that's kind of similar, maybe not maliciously, but if you have packages by the same name, um, we completely avoid that by including the source code in the source tree. Maybe I misunderstood the question, but... Yeah, I, I can imagine it's like, do you like compile something like in the way poetry or pip tools would do? That's my, my interpretation, but... Um, I'm just not sure. Okay. Um, maybe some clarification would be nice. Okay, and then last one. Um, using Git submodules needs constant update of the dependent projects for an update in the submodule project. How do you tackle that if there is a breaking change? Um, you don't because you can point submodules to branches and tags. So we always point our submodules to some stable tag, and that's always going to be in the history of the Git repository. So um, we have a lot of uh, our components that depend on old versions and that might not be compatible. But the beauty of it is that you package your library with your project and, and check out that branch, and it just works. Um, we don't have that problem. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Then um, thank you very much.